And the most obvious person and our crucial choice to get in touch with was obviously Lale Kalili. So Lale is a very different kind of academic. She's a professor of Middle East politics at SOAS and well known for her writings and her academic work. She's the author of Heroes and Martyrs of Palestine. So we're really, really thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for coming and, and being with us. And I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at 5.45. I know that you probably want to escape and go and eat or drink. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to Schumann, to Antonia, and to Oscar for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to be clicking on images and reading from a paper. Stop me if I use a term with which you're not familiar. Um, among the holdings of the British Museum, warehoused in their massive storage among around 8 million objects, is a carved dark gravestone inscribed in Hebrew and dated 1333, so about 700 years old, from the port of Aden in Yemen. It's from Aden. The inscription in Hebrew says, Mayest thou rest in peace until the Redeemer cometh. And the month of Tabith in the year 1333 was gathered in peace to her fathers, the worthy, respected woman, Madmiya, the daughter of Sa'diya, the son of Abraham. May his memory be blessed. That's the end of the inscription. The stone was donated to the British Museum in 1886. So it's about uh, 150 years there by Thomas Holdsworth Newman of the shipping firm, Mr. Newman Hunt and Company. The stone had been brought over to Britain, however, 30 years before that, so in 1850s, um, when it had been used as a ballast for a ship sailing from India to Zanzibar and onwards to Britain. Does anybody know what ballast is? When a ship is empty, you need to have a weight in it for it to be actually able to balance itself. So they had, the Brits, had looted gravestones to use as ballast for ships in the hold of the ships. I've tried to find out what sort of ship it was, what it carried, but have not yet been successful. The shipping firm itself owned whalers in Newfoundland, ships that went and caught whales, owned vineyards in Oporto in Portugal, and traded with Mediterranean ports. There is much about this object that I would like to note here in passing. It speaks of a long history of Jewish diasporic existence in Aden. It bespeaks of an imperial carelessness that plunders gravestones for ballast. And it points to Aden as a significant, perhaps the most significant coaling and later fueling, oiling station between Europe and India for ships. Here I will say a few words about ballasts and use that to segue into a discussion of the ecological after effects of shipping. What maritime trade means and has meant to the world and a few words about the ship and the port as an international of workers, not a utopia nor a heterotopia but a real place of work. In his beautiful short reflection on ship's ballast, the academic Charlie Haley recalls Joseph Conrad's obsession with ballast, telling us that ships are either in cargo or in ballast, where the weight, sometimes of stone, later of coal, still later of seawater and fuel, is required to balance the ship when the ship is low in cargo. Landscapes were harvested of ballast, so when ships would arrive somewhere and they needed ballast, they would just loot the landscape of shingle, of sand, of rocks, in order to have ballast, in, and in the case of Aden, of gravestones. And they were looted clean of sa sand and shingle and rock. And although ballast may speak of empty ships, of ships that have delivered their good in one direction, and are now sailing in the opposite direction with their cargo heaved to port, it also speaks of resource extraction in ways that would be considered unproductive, but which is fundamental to capitalist trade. This resource extraction transformed landscapes, both of the places where the ballast was looted and the places that ballast was dumped, uh, in ways that have been forgotten. Once a ship arrived in port, 
uh, and it wanted to load, ballast had to be discarded. And despite laws that prevented the discharging of stone and shingle and sand into the sea, Charlie Haley tells us that discarded ballast spawned landscapes born of displaced materials from far-flung lands. And ballast islands and hills, this wastage became infrastructure because they used the shingle from ballast uh, for, for example, for roads, for uh, railways, and for buildings. So if you're in Britain and look at the railways, in between the two metal rails, you have wooden uh, connectors. And on top of that, you often have shingle. And some of the oldest routes, that shingle came from ships ballast from far afield. And as you can see, these are ballast islands and hills in Seattle and Newcastle. Both of those are from late 19th century, early 20th century. The harvesting and dumping of ballast also echoes through the dredging and land, reclam land reclamation processes that transform landscapes near and far. If in an earlier time, landscapes were transformed by the harvesting and dumping of ballast material, today making ports requires dredging, which means digging up the ground, the sea in particular, on the one hand, and land reclamation on the other. The southern part of the Gulf is extraordinarily shallow. It's in fact one of the shallowest seas in the world, where the average depth is around 30 meters, and actually close to the shore, it's five or six meters in some places. And as ships become ever larger, shipping channels have to be constantly deepened to maintain the ability of these ships to pass. Not to mention that these channels have to be dredged to protect them from undersea shamal currents in the Gulf. Thus dredging becomes a kind of Sisyphean task that has to be permanently maintained. And for this reason, dredging is obviously invasive and continuous activity. Dredgers transform the subsea surfaces, they dig up the subsea surfaces. In places where there has been war, there's enormous amounts of pollutants that have sedimented at the bottom of the sea. So when you dredge, you also disturb sedimented pollutants. You change the acidity of seawater in places. You sometimes churn up reefs, coral reefs, and distress and trouble marine habitats. Dredging can also transform coastal areas as it shifts the dynamics of undersea currents. And in a sensitive coastal ecosystem, such as the Southern Gulf, such transformations could change the sabkhas, the salt flats, the mangroves, and other ecological features that characterize the area. But to me, what is perhaps even more fascinating than dredging, and in some ways it echoes that ballast harvest and dumping, is the fast-growing international trade in sand. Sand is the second largest commodity tra uh, traded commodity in the world after oil, in terms of value and volume, which is necessita necessitated by the astronomical escalation in urban construction worldwide, but specifically in the land reclamation that characterizes port expansion in places like Singapore, Hong Kong, or Jabal Ali, New Sohar and Dogham ports in Oman, King Abdullah port in Saudi Arabia, the New Hamad port in Qatar, the New Khalifa port in Abu Dhabi, and the like. Here, the first order effect is, of course, on the local ecology affected by the dumping of concrete into the sea. But in order for you to make concrete, you need sand. And what's interesting is that the desert sand, which is of course the most available sand in the Arabian Peninsula, is not suitable, in fact, for making concrete. And the reason for that is because the grains are way too fine and homogeneous. And so what you actually need is a kind of a sand that can be harvested from riverbeds and beaches, which as you can see from this image, tends to have very heterogeneous, very differentiated grain size. And so it's useful for pouring concrete. So it's quite interesting. You can see how much land reclamation matters. This is a map of Singapore, and it shows the extent of land reclamation there over the course of the last 150 years. The map shows original land in the sort of grayish color, the reclaimed land in the pinkish color, and the future land reclamation plans that are going on, and some of them have already been instituted in the red uh, color. As it is obvious, a great deal of that facilitates the expansion of the Singapore port. And you can see that it's um, usually when you see those kinds of uh, rectangular shapes, those are ports. Um, 
the construction projects for Singapore have led to the looting of riverbeds and beaches of Myanmar, Burma, for gravel to be poured on the seabeds of Singapore. This has led to coastal erosion and silting of riverbeds in Myanmar itself. So the making of ports and transport infrastructure in one place, in Singapore, it requires the despoilation of completely a different location. So a port in Singapore or the Arabian Peninsula requires the ecological transformation of another country's riverbeds or coasts. I think this focus, first historically on ballast and its echoes in dredging and land reclamation, is crucial in thinking about shipping precisely because it reminds us that the movement of ships across the sea is not simply about the movement of cargo. It's not just about the movement of cargo or about production and circulation, um, or at least it doesn't stop there. But rather, the ostensible routes of trade also map geographies of empire, of new physical landscapes, of new forms of labor and rule, of remade ecologies, and of course, of forms of imperial hierarchy which see nothing in using a 700-year-old gravestone of a young Jewish woman as a weight that keeps the ship in equilibrium. Today, the commercial ships traversing the seas include container ships, um, over to the far right bottom, oil and chemical tankers, that's this one right here, the Maersk one. Uh, row rows, which are roll on, roll off uh, uh, ships that carry usually cars. And that's the big one on top in the middle. Um, and bulk carriers, that's carriers that carry, for example, iron ore or grain, stuff that doesn't come in containers, which is the top right. This one over here is an LNG carrier, as it's obviously a liquid natural gas carrier. It is worth noting the extent to which the cobwebbed seas that these ships traverse tell us about the world economy that still depends not on virtual or fictive. You constantly hear everything is now virtual. Everything is now about fictional commodities. It's all about the internet. But rather, actually, on stubbornly material and concrete objects. Speed, for example, which Oscar was talking about earlier, is valued in a lot of different um, guises as efficiency or as packets of data traveling wirelessly or through cabled connections as quicker delivery time, as higher productivity, and shorter communication time. But speed, interestingly, is still not necessarily a characteristic of the vast majority of the world's good, about 90%, traversing its seas. So 90% of the goods we use travel by ship, and yet it is unbelievably slow. So I've been on uh, a ship from Malta to Dubai twice. The shorter time took about two and a bit weeks. The, the longer time took about three and a bit weeks. As the great theorist and photographer of seaborne labor and trade, Alan Sekular, wrote, large-scale material flows remain intractable. Ex acceleration is not absolute. The hydrodynamics of large capacity hulls and the power output of diesel engines sets a limit to the speed of cargo ships not far beyond that of the first quarter of the 20th century. It still takes about eight days to cross the Atlantic and about 12 to cross the Pacific from the US. Further, although a great deal of scholarship and hype makes us think that the most value produced is in fictive commodities, for example, in derivatives or money moving or being forged literally through ma manipulation, through financialization and the transmission of value through ether, in fact, traveling through ports will tell you that things, many things, most things, are still concrete, solid, earthbound, and dense. Of the material that is carried, the largest value in, uh, volume in tons is by far the raw commodities still extracted from the earth and transported from one point to the other. These are the basic stuff from which everything else is made and the basic stuff which will run the engines of the world. So oil and gas, which is the blue segment at the bottom, uh, and what are called the five main bulk cargoes, iron ore, coal, grains, uh, wheat or corn, bauxite, from which aluminium is extracted, and phosphate rocks, which is used for uh, agriculture. And that's the brownie beige area up there. But manufactured goods matter, of course, too. Although the bits that shows the containers at the very top seems really quite small in terms of tonnage, given that most likely it is manufactured goods, that's the, that's the stuff that travels in the container ships, 
uh, and in containers, in boxes, it will inevitably have a much higher value. So although it's a much smaller amount by tonnage, it costs a lot more. There's, it's actually quite a lot more money traveling there. Further, the whole point of containers is an increase in the density of the material that's transported. More and more weight per volume, packed in ways that fewer people facilitate uh, smaller uh, volumes, moved over a vaster span of space in less time than before. Already in mid-19th century, Karl Marx was envisioning the spread of world markets connected through networks of production and webs of maritime and rail transport. In Grundrisse, he, form, uh, he famously wrote, the more developed the capital, the more extensive the market over which it circulates, which forms the spatial orbit of its circulation, the more does it strive simultaneously for an ever great, greater extension of the market and for greater annihilation of space by time. So the more you produce, the more you expand, and that causes actually even more expansion still. And perhaps looking at the largest container ports in the world gives some indication of where the raw materials, in particular coal, oil and iron ore, travel to where things are produced and the finished products are loaded from. So this is the top uh, however many lists. This is from 2012. The list more or less remains uh, constant. Sometimes Singapore and Shanghai switch places. Sometimes Jabal Ali moves up or down. But generally, this is the list of, uh, well, it's the top 10 and then, or it's top 9, and then are the Middle Eastern ports that appear in the top 50 container ports in the world. So it's not surprising uh, that nine of the top ten container ports in the world are located in China, Singapore, and Korea, which are essentially factories of the world. What is perhaps more surprising is that Jabal Ali Dubai, which is just a little bit further south of here, appears in the top ten, and that it is ahead of the biggest European port, Rotterdam, by a couple of places. Rotterdam, which doesn't appear on this list, is number 11. Although Rotterdam also has other port elements which ranks at number six in the world in terms of total cargo, so that's bulk oil. In fact, it is the second largest oil terminal in the world after Dammam, which is quite interesting. Oil comes there and then goes out as refined product. Of course, it's not surprising that the Arabian Peninsula would be the main transport hub for oil, right? It's where the oil is produced. This image is one I took when I was on a container ship trip from the radar screen in the wheelhouse. Our ship was steaming alongside the eastern coast of the United Arab Emirates, so over in the Gulf of Oman, and this dense concentration of triangles, each of those triangles is a ship. So that dense concentration of triangles indicating ships is just outside of the Fujairah port. So here, that's Fujairah, and up there is Khorfakar. Our ship was going to Khorfakar because it was a container ship, but down here we were crossing by Fujairah, and you can see that there are so many hundreds of ships at anchor waiting to fill up. This density of ships at anchor, waiting their turn to load petroleum products, is apparently repeated all around the Arabian Peninsula, in particular in places like Dammam. Uh, the International Energy Agency's statistics um, on the world's oil choke points are indicative of the significance of the Arabian Peninsula, where the volume of oil transported is more than a third of the maritime oil supply in the world. So there's, of course, oil is transported by pipelines as well, but a third of the world's maritime tankers, essentially, uh, carry oil from the Arabian Peninsula. But then the next question is what accounts for Jabal Ali port being ranked in the top 10 container ports? Oil is understandable. Why containers? Or the current emphasis on investing in other transshipment ports in the Arabian Peninsula? Um, first, an explanation. I took that photo arriving into Jabal Ali uh, just a few months ago. Some ports are transshipment ports. I think uh, James explained what that means. Meaning that they act as a special kind of hub where much larger ships unload goods that are then shipped on smaller vessels or other forms of transport to the surrounding regions. In this regard, Jabal Ali is fascinating. 
a bit more than 50% of all the goods passing through Jabal Ali are not intended for the UAE. They're, in fact, transshipments. And they are shipped not quite... Uh, I mean, that percentage is really high for Singapore. Singapore's 80% of all their shipments are actually transshipments. But still, 50% is enormous. More than half of the goods that come into Dubai are sent off somewhere else. Given that the main trading partners for Dubai are China and India, and then Pakistan and Iran for exports, one can assume that a significant percentage of the transshipment flows are from China to Dubai and from there to India and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Pakistan. One temptation is to think of these trade routes as a kind of echoes of the oceanic grooves of trade carved by the significant 19th century Indian Ocean trade a kind of ghostly permanence of route making in the sea itself. Earlier, Omar was talking about a palimpsest of remembered routes in the desert. And in some ways, these Indian Ocean routes are also a kind of a uh, seaborne palimpsest of routes. These routes are familiar routes, scented with spice and odorous with debt bondage, slavery, and the depredations of various East India companies, the Dutch one, the French one, the, uh, and of course the British one, and so many other neo-colonial companies involved in extraction and production and trade. But the story of the Indian Ocean trade of the 19th century is perhaps the most significant to me because it is clear that since then, a great many ports in this corner of West Asia have fallen and a great many ports have risen in their place. And this is a great deal of the puzzle I'm trying to sort out in my larger project, to explain why Adan and Basra and so many old and venerable Iranian ports have been replaced by newer ports in Jabal Ali, Salala, Khorfakan, and so on. In order to figure this puzzle, since January 2015, I've traveled on container ships from Malta to Dubai tw twice. I have to confess to being overwhelmed with awe for the sublime sea, with fascination with the vast behemoth of machinery carrying me and thousands of tons of goods in the sea. Uh, the bigger ship that I traveled on was 390 meters long. That's three times the length of the Empire State Building. I love arriving in the port, and as Walter Benjamin, another freight traveler, wrote, listening to the sounds of the unloading freighters all around me as the modernized music of the world. It's such a beautiful thing. I love the loneliness of being on the surface of the deep, standing on deck and looking out to the Mediterranean or the Red Sea or the Indian Ocean. But there is, and there is, of course, a literary and philosophical tradition that makes us think of the sea as something eternal or transcendental or grand. People philosophize as soon as they look at the sea. And yet the sea is made as much as the land is. Underwater cables crisscross seabeds. And as a fabulous new book by Nicole Starosielski tells us, this geography of undersea networks contains histories of cable lying, militarization, and economic deprivation, where new modes of spatial organization have led to displacement of local residents, for example, at landing points for the cables. It has always struck me that the way to think about the sea as a geography is to think of the sea not only as this three-dimensional space with the palimpsest of power embedded therein, but also to think of the sea as history in the, world, uh, in the words of the great um, Caribbean poet Derek Wal Walcott. This means that history includes the invisible roots of trade that connect long-standing bonds of commerce and trust from coast to coast, from India to the Gulf, for example. The three-dimensional layers of human labors, which include cables and shipping channels, but also bones of sailors, soldiers, slaves, indentured workers, and migrants. History strangely shows us the consistency of the maps of war and trade across centuries. Um, and the ports which anchor the sea routes are palimpsests of history, politics, and socioeconomic relations themselves. But ports are not only points of entry and exit for commercial goods and shipping, uh, and, and it's not only about trade. As Paul Nizan, who actually worked in Aden in the 1930s, has written in his wonderful Aden Arabi, shipping is about the intertwining of war, commerce, and transit. Shipping and ports are hugely important in establishing colonies on far shores, in empires of free trade, in controlling far distances. 
In a different context, in his magnificent Moby Dick, Herman Melville has written about how commercial whaling and conquest went hand in hand. He writes, and I quote him directly, if American and European warships, men of war, now peacefully ride in one savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and the glory of the whale ship, which originally showed them the way and first interpreted between them and the savages. So where the whale ship went, the warships followed. Visiting a map of maritime trade, this is a map of whaling, US whaling routes. Pay attention to all the stuff in the uh, Pacific and the densities. And then if you look, all of those places where the routes converged are places that the US annexed at the end of the 19th century. So today, so beyond this, today, the U.S. declares one of its primary global interests to be the smooth flow of shipping along the most important global shipping routes and the unfettered flow of commerce through the world's oceans. But not only are the world's shipping routes to be protected, but also the ports where the ships load and unload. Ports are strategic assets. Commercial ships can be commandeered to haul material and personnel for war fighting. Logistics firms become war fighting machines and adjuncts to military logistics operations. And this has been true in every war that fought by the US in the Middle East. As Deborah Cowan has shown in her extraordinary book called The Deadly Life of Logistics, US bases and detention centers, for example, in Umm Qasr in Iraq, or at the Clark Air Force, ba Air Force Base in the Philippines are transmuted into logistics hubs. So the US left Camp Nama, which is where uh, some of the worst torture of its military happened in between 2003 and 2008. And Camp Nama became Omega Sar Logistics City or Basra Logistics City. The same with Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. So these military bases immediately became hubs for logistics. This fungibility, this exchangeability of the military and commercial functions of infrastructure is of course nothing new. And roads, markets and schools, and I quote roads and markets and schools, were the holy trinity of colonial pacification through most of the 19th century. But the final bit of this story, so it's not just commerce, it's not just the military. The final bit of this story is of course the labor abroad, aboard ships and at ports. Foucault, Michel Foucault, has called the ship and every place a heterotopia. He writes in this really beautiful passage, she says, the boat is a floating piece of space, a place without a place that exists by itself, that is closed in on itself, and at the same time is given over to the infinity of the sea. Remember that philosophizing I was telling you about? And that from port to port, from tack to tack, from brothel to brothel, it goes as far as the colonies in search of the most precious treasures they conceal in their gardens. You will understand why the boat has not only been for our civilization from the 16th century until the present, the great instrument of economic development, but has been simultaneously the greatest reserve of the imagination. In his reading of Melville's Moby Dick, the great Caribbean historian, theorist, and Marxist C.L.R. James celebrates the mariners, renegades, and castaways on board ships and describes the ship, and I quote, as a world federation of modern industrial workers who owe allegiance to no nationality. They owe no allegiance to anybody or anything except the work they have to do and the relations with one another on which that work depends. But unfortunately, and I'm nearly towards the end. This utopian view belies the deliberate production of difference on board ships, at ports, and in the making of transportation infrastructures. On board ships, even, perhaps especially, ships that are flagged to European countries, which means that they follow the minimal labor, environmental, and health and safety regulations of European countries. The rights of seafarers have increasingly eroded since the end of the Second World War. Today, we often see a dual wage and contract system on board ships, where officers, who are usually in these uh, European ships, from Eastern European uh, countries on contracts that give them two months off after four months, of, uh, four months at sea. The crew usually come the from the Philippines or from India, and they work nine months on and one month off. They don't see their families for nine months, and they're paid a fraction of the European officers. <laughs> 
at ports, we have a similarly striated system of work where European managers and technical experts, Indian clerical officers and skilled workers from the global south or from the European south are joined by the proletarian wage workers produced by war, expropriation and primitive accumulation of the regions in which they live. These differences manifest not only in the variation of salary, level of education and access to state resources, but also in the quality of the workers' housing, the social environs enjoyed by them, and the urban neighborhoods and landscapes they, they occupy, and the extent to which they can also bring families with them to their places of work. This is true as much of Singapore as it is of any of the ports in the Middle East and elsewhere. The ports exemplify this striation, the walls of language and community that separate these workers and makes a mockery of illusions of utopian ports and ships are precisely the technologies of divide and rule couched in neoliberal language of expertise, labor market structures and recruitment networks. The day-to-day -day experience of the workers on board ships and on land is the backbreaking tedium of work rather than some utopian international. So in a sense, these invisible places these ports, twinkling in the far distance, securitized and made inaccessible, become arenas for capital and war and milieus of struggle for rights and citizenship and belonging. These awesome spectacles, the ships and the ports, demand of us attentiveness to history and geography. As Bruce Robbins has written, and I finish with this wonderful quote, infrastructure needs to be made visible in order to see how our present landscape is the product of past projects and past struggles. Thank you very much.